The views and opinions of this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Well, we've got a lot to talk about in regards to the weather here as we enter the middle of the month of September. U.S. weather, how are things looking as the onslaught of harvest is upon us? Also, what's going on in South America? Some dryness concerns down there. Is it something to worry about or not right now? We're going to talk about all that and more. Joining us for conversation, Eric Snodgrass with Nutrient Ag Solutions is with us. Eric, good to talk with you. Hope you had a great weekend, sir. Yeah, I did. It was uh, a little hot, though. I mean, it's, here we are in mid-September, and these temperatures are still cranking here while the West has been quite cold. In fact, there's been some snow in the mountains, and deep lows keep rolling through the West, and if they're there, they're not here. And so it's been uh, dry and warm. So yeah, this was an interesting weekend here for mid-September. Very true. Very true. Well, uh, one of the things we should talk about to start is the remnants of Hurricane Francine, that along with a tropical low in the Carolinas now this week. So, I mean, watching the southeast and watching the Mississippi River Valley, the lower Mississippi River Valley in particular, uh, to see if any of this activity helped out with some of those low water levels. I mean, sum this up for us, all this activity we've been watching throughout the uh, Delta and southeast here in the recent days. Yeah, so Francine, you know, came up the Mississippi, um, produced a tremendous amount of flooding in parts of southern Louisiana, some local flooding in Mississippi, some big time flooding in Alabama, but it, it barely made it up. I mean, I think how far did it get? Maybe southern Illinois got some rain out of it, southern Indiana, western Kentucky, Tennessee got some uh, in parts of Missouri. So there were places north of that that were like, keep coming. We need more rain out of this. And it never got there. So the fact that the Mississippi basin, almost all of it, except for even the lower part of the basin, but, but you know, the middle and upper plus the Ohio river Valley, plus the Missouri river Valley are so low on soil moisture right now. All the hurricane did was bring up water levels by uh, two feet. So we're still at minus five feet uh, at Memphis, which is kind of a good point, to, a good reference point to, to keep track of all three of those basins. Uh, and, and yeah, it moved off. And so where's our next system? Well, it's not in the Gulf in the near term. I'm still looking out there late next week for some Gulf development, which honestly, if we can get another system to come up, get a bit farther north, it could be great for the drought situation. Bad for harvest, great for the drought situation. Uh, and then, yeah, you're, you're right. There's one other system to be watching and it's, uh, it's off the Carolina coast. I'm a little surprised it had, I'm looking at it over here. It's got sustained winds over 50 miles an hour, which beats the criteria to become a tropical storm. But the national hurricane center has not, um, has not changed it yet. And I'm curious, they were supposed to do an 11 AM update and they still have, yeah, they still have it at potential mm -hmm. tropical cyclone eight with sustained winds of 50 miles an hour. So it has to be a um, it has to be 39 miles an hour to become a tropical storm. So I'm just curious why they haven't given it a name yet. Well, whatever, that, that's their call. It's still a system that's going to hit the Carolinas with a lot of rain. And there's already been in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, has picked up uh, a foot of rain this morning, some places. And we're looking at another one to five inches. But that doesn't get over the Appalachian Mountains. It doesn't get into the very dry parts of the Ohio Basin. So, you know, that, this is this is interesting. I very true. Yeah, we're just not able to get the moisture in the places we'd like to see it ahead of, you know, the full harvest push. Well, and speaking of moisture, I know we've been seeing some in parts of the plains, the northern plains in particular, and then up into Canada as well. Uh, talk about this for us, Eric. Yeah, just before we jumped on, I, I was talking to a guy in Canada and I said, tell me what all this rain in Canada means, because I, you, you probably wish you had it way back in June, but We've got, uh, I still think there are four more systems that are going to go through the Canadian prairie, um, you know, in varying strengths, but over the next uh, 10 days. And he's like, well, the canola guys, I mean, they see these as, as multi-million dollar rains. And what happens is you get this rain late. He's, he's just, he told me, because I don't understand it, but he told me, he said, listen, it tends to uh, weaken the stock later, which makes it easier to harvest, but it tends to put on at the very end of the, of the crop you know cycle here just a, a better seed and so it's overall a good thing now the barley guys some of those guys know this rain is not what they want going forward and it's gonna be problematic and so it's interesting to see that but when will that rain get into the corn belt i mean that's the issue we, we need to get some rain on the missouri valley we need to get it in the mississippi valley and the ohio valley as i mentioned 
And it looks like mid to late week, we're going to have one system that uh, first comes through and hits parts of the Western Corn Belt with quite a bit of rainfall. I saw some models picking up two to three inches in places. That's not widespread everywhere, but better chances of, of getting some decent rains. But does it get to Illinois? Does it get to Indiana and Ohio? I don't think it does. I think we're going to have to wait into next week before we have a chance to rain. And until then, we're looking at high temperatures each day in the, uh, you know, in the, in the 80s, mid 80s at times. So, um, yeah, very interesting fall forecast or early fall forecast here, giving us some summer heat and some uh, rapidly developing drought. So just to give you another number, Jesse, I got a lot of my mind this morning. <laughs> <laughs> you know, back in June, we only had 11% of uh, the United States in D1 to D4 drought. And now we're at uh, 34%. So that's a tripling of the area of drought since June. Yet a lot of that just came on in the last month here. Uh, for some folks. So that's when it's been worst. And to be honest, for a lot of folks, it is not nearly as impactful as it would have been in, you know, late July and early August. So um, it'll be interesting to see if some of these bigger crop numbers we've been hearing from all the, you know, the big tours, if they start to, you know, be, be adjusted down as the combines start to roll. No, that's a good point. Uh, very true. As we're thinking about this fall weather and into the winter months, I know some some new data to look at there as well as we look out a little longer term here in the U.S., Eric. So what are you seeing right now as we look a little farther into fall and into the winter months? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm going to be watching to the end of the month the most dominant form of weather coming from something called the WPO, the West Pacific Oscillation. What is it? Long story short, deep lows in the Bering Sea, okay, and high pressure south of it. That's what's going to send these next four lows into the northwest, and we might continue to see something like that going forward. So that means that they go into the northwest and then leave through Canada. They don't come all the way to the east. So a lot of us in the central United States to the eastern U.S. are going to be drier in this pattern. The western Corn Belt's got a better chance of rain, but we, we don't really here in the eastern Corn Belt. Um, but it, overall, it's a mild pattern. And so finishing this month, getting into October, like I'm, I'm looking for any threat of really cold air coming in. I don't see it anytime soon. If that changes, of course, you and I will talk about it. But, uh, you know, that seems to be the way things are shaping up. Now, after that, I think La Nina starts to have a little bit more of an influence. Ocean temperatures this morning, we're at minus 0 0.8 degrees C. So that is well past our thresholds for calling the ocean temperature part of this La Nina-like. Uh, and what that typically means is a bit more of a mild uh, and dry start to fall, and then a cold finish to fall, like as you get into December. So unlike a year ago where we didn't have winter, we may get an earlier start to some colder temperatures here and a more earlier start to an active pattern in the Ohio River Valley for storm systems. To be honest with you, I want as much, I want as soon as we're done harvesting, I want as much just terrible, crappy weather as we can get on these dry river basins before things freeze up. And uh, that'll at least get me away from worrying about the fact we're going to carry fall drought into next spring, which if we do that, then we become ultra dependent on March and April rains to cure drought problems. And they can do it, but if they don't come in, then you have this underlying problem of a lack of soil moisture. So I'm putting a lot of weight on La Nina uh, continue to develop and becoming a more dominant factor. Uh, but until I see that being the case, you know, we're going to have to watch this thing week by week. How about South America? What's the latest you are seeing down there? I've heard everything from drought to wildfires, et cetera. So where do things stand right now in South America, Eric? Yeah. So the dry season was really dry in Brazil. I mean, one of the driest, but that, that can be undone by a week of monsoonal rains and it'll be history. So where's it been wet? It's been extremely wet in Southern Brazil. So think of states like Southern Mato Grosso do Sul, parts of Paraná, Santa Catarina, Rio Grande do Sul. Paraguay, Uruguay, and northern Argentina have had a lot of flooding rains, and that's that's actually a problem down there right now. That's way too much early, early rain. Think of like northwestern Corn Belt earlier this year. That's the kind of problems they're having early now. But the monsoon is not there yet. It's not established, and we've been watching for the last, oh my gosh, what, about 15 days in a row. We saw, that's two weeks, yeah, since the beginning of this month, okay, we have watched the European model predict better rains in October when 80% of the soybean crop has been harvested, or excuse me, will be planted. And then over the weekend, we finally saw that model pull back a bit. It's now showing a little bit of a drier signal. Now, I, I just to be clear, I didn't say dry, I said drier. So there's still the projection that by the time we get out there at about uh, October 21st, they will have received across like the center west area, uh, two to three inches of rain, which is what they want. They want to get that to get everything established and get going. 
And I still don't have any major indicators that the northern growing areas are going to suffer through drought problems early in the season like they did a year ago. To be honest, Jesse, my biggest concern is the flooding in southern Brazil. I mean, it could be a situation where we hit about 30% of the acres down there with so much rainfall that there are going to be delays and it's going to cause problems with, uh, you know, the initial stand quality and, and, and start for the soybean crop and the full season corn that's planted down there as well. So unlike the last couple of weeks where I've been kind of saying, I don't see any major stresses coming in Brazil right now. I'm starting to change my tune a little bit, especially in Southern Brazil with too much water. All right. Good thoughts as always. Anything final you want to leave us with here this week that you're watching on the weather front? Yeah. I mean, I always like to look at other places around the world. It's going to rain like mad in the outback and nobody cares. So they don't grow anything in the middle of Australia, but it's going to be really, really heavy <laughs> rain there. But I got to go talk to a bunch of Australians tonight and I know they're going to ask a bit about it. And so uh, I'm going to keep an eye on it. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's about it. Um, and uh, I think we'll just have to watch how this fall shapes up. I think a lot of folks are going to be concerned about any lingering drop problems going into winter. I don't want to worry about it. And I know they don't either. So we got to watch these next 60 days carefully. Very true. Agweather.com, ag-wx.com. For more information, Eric Snodgrass with Nutrient Ag Solutions. Always good to talk with you, sir. Thanks for joining us. You bet. Have a good one, Jesse. Make sure to subscribe to the Market Talk YouTube channel. There, you can watch our latest interviews with the top market analysts in the country, find bonus content, and much more. Just go to youtube.com slash market talk egg and hit the subscribe button. Or you can search for Market Talk Egg on YouTube.